Hey everybody, Max and Max's Models here. We're here with aviation artist and historian Mike Machette. And recently I was uh, pondering uh, how Douglas wound up with such a strong connection in the Navy making single engine aircraft, yet in the transport world they made big multi-engine aircraft. And he's the perfect man to, uh, to ask. And so I will hand it over to him. Thank you, Max. Uh, greetings and great to be with you. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, share the story of Douglas Aircraft. We're going to talk about Douglas Models as well uh, with all your great uh, viewers, and I appreciate the opportunity. Our pleasure. Yeah. So uh, I think the easiest way to explain the uh, the wide range of airplanes that Douglas uh, built would be to talk about uh, the number of uh, different uh, plant locations uh, that the company had and what was built at each one, and I think that'll kind of give us a framework, and then we can we can go from there. Mm-hmm. Um, just a little prelude, Don Douglas uh, was born in Brooklyn, New York, in the late 1800s. Uh, at the age of 16, he saw the Wright Flyer at uh, Fort Myer, Virginia in a demonstration and uh, was inspired to a career in aviation, but he was also uh, had a deep affinity for the uh, sea. He was a, a brilliant uh, sailor, yachtsman. Uh, in 1932, he was on the team that uh, won the silver medal in the uh, Olympics in Los Angeles for sailing. And uh, so he was an accomplished uh, sailor. And he was uh, a midshipman at Annapolis originally, beginning his, what he thought would be a Navy career. Uh, a great story that I've always heard uh, was that uh, he was building models in his dorm room and flying them off the roof of the building. And these were rubber band uh, powered. And on a Sunday morning, he was flying his models and one of them hit the head of an admiral and he wasn't at uh, Annapolis anymore. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I'm going with it. I think it's a great story. <laughs> uh, he wound up uh, at MIT because he really wanted uh, more of a challenge and really wanted a, a solid education in, uh, in aeronautics. And he became the first graduate of MIT with a bachelor's in uh, aeronautical engineering. And uh, so that, that really set the, uh, set the path. Uh, he started the company in 1921 in a, uh, an abandoned movie uh, lot in uh, Santa Monica, California and uh, then moved to what was Clover Field, which is the airport that's still there today. Uh, and that began the, uh, uh, the, the construction of the Douglas Cloudster, which is a one of a kind airplane. And the first production contract, which was, guess what? The DT-2 uh, torpedo bomber, D standing for Douglas T torpedo, second model. And that was the first production contract of the company. And I think it was something like, you know, $1.6 million or something for 12 airplanes. But, um, uh, that kind of began the whole process. And so up through World War II, Santa Monica was the, uh, the headquarters and uh, they were building uh, all the early airplanes. The World Cruisers came out of there in 1924, first around the world. Um, and then up into uh, getting ready for the war years, the B-18, um, the A-20, uh, there was a lot of uh, activity with that. And then of course the DC-3 in 1935. Uh, and so you had everything that Douglas was building in that one place. In 1941, they built the Long Beach plant, and that was an interesting arrangement. It was built specifically for uh, building B-17 uh, flying fortresses under license from Boeing. Um, Mr. Boeing and Mr. Douglas were very close friends. Uh, Mr. Boeing had a DC-5 as his personal uh, executive airplane uh, and left the Douglas logo on it, if you can try that today. Um, and so uh, uh, they worked out an arrangement under President Roosevelt, the, the War Powers Act, and the Long Beach plant was built uh, to, to create the B-17s. And then that also added the C-47 and the A-26 toward the end of the war. Uh, Long Beach went on to become the Air Force plant. So all the big transports, the C-74, C-124, Glowmaster II, uh, C-133, Cargo Master, uh, and right up to the C-17, uh, all came out of Long Beach. Uh, then you had uh, Huntington Beach, uh, which was the last of the plants to open, 1957, uh, and that was space and missiles. So you had the Thor, uh, the Nike series, um, the Honest John, that all came out of Huntington Beach. And uh, saving the best for last, El Segundo was the Navy branch. El Segundo is a city just south of what is LAX today. And so uh, at that time, in the, in the mid-30s, uh, Don Douglas and Jack Northrup uh, were associated. Uh, Northrup was a subsidiary of Douglas at that time. And their chief designer was a guy named Ed Heineman. And so if you look at the lines of the SBD Dauntless, 
and look at the Northrop A-17, you can see the lineage. And uh, Northrop left in 1938 to start his own company, Northrop, uh, the Northrop Corporation. Uh, and so <coughs> with Air Force transports, all sorts of Navy attack airplanes and uh, dive bombers, um, the passenger transports, and uh, later on, of course, the missiles and satellites and things like that. So that gives you a rough idea of the, uh, the major operations in and around the Los Angeles area. They also had Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Chicago during the war, satellite operation, and uh, Yuma, Arizona was the big flight test center because it was out in the desert and away from populated areas. So that gives you kind of a you know, broad brush view of what uh, was going on and the, all the different kinds of airplanes that they were building at that time. But the Navy stuff all came out of uh, El Segundo. Well, given as many times as his name pops up, uh, Ed Heineman seems to be a pretty important figure in the history of Douglas. So I wonder yeah. if you could touch on him a little bit. Yeah, he was the, the father of all the Navy airplanes. Uh, they even nicknamed the, if you look at, uh, there's a beautiful line that curves up from the top of the fuselage up into the fin on every, uh, even the Skyrocket, the uh, A3D, all of Navy jets had that and they call it the Heineman curve. And he was a brilliant engineer. Uh, visionary. He and Don uh, Douglas had a very close relationship. And uh, just like Kelly Johnson at uh, Lockheed or Alex Carvelli at Republic or any of the greats that uh, really put their stamp on the looks of those airplanes, Ed Heineman was the, was the guy. Um, you had asked the, in our correspondence, you were talking about how do airplanes wind up being built or made or how does that happen? Uh, and the, uh, the Bureau of Aeronautics for the Navy uh, was the procurement arm. So they, they would come up with a requirement. We need a, a, a torpedo bomber that'll carry this much payload and have a three-man crew and have this much range and go this fast. And then the companies would meet those requirements and the company with the best proposal or best uh, design would wind up uh, with a production contract. Many times they would have later on what they call a fly-off competition uh, where they would build two examples from two different companies operate them, see which one worked best, and then and then choose it. Uh, F-16 comes to mind, F-15, there were a lot of uh, companies. X-15 had three or four different co contractors competing for the, for the uh, contract. It was North American, of course. But Douglas wound up with a lot of their attack, uh, torpedo bomber and attack airplanes, uh, meeting those requirements for, from uh, a Bureau of Aeronautics. The uh, one Douglas that comes to mind that I think unfairly got a bad reputation was the devastator because of what happened at Midway without fighter escort. But I was researching the airplane. There's actually been several books written about it. And apparently when it came out in, I believe, 35, 36, mm -hmm. it was not only a cutting edge airplane, but was, uh, you know, most fighters were still biplanes. It was considered to meet or exceed all the requirements. But of course, technology was leapfrogging so fast that two years mm -hmm. later, three years later. And, uh, but the more I read about the airplane, when you get away from the World War II accounts about being slow and everything because technology advanced, I actually found out that it was an extremely inventive aircraft, a lot of first, uh, you know, the big hydraulic folding wings, all metal and everything else. And, uh, but, uh, and I think they only made about less than a hundred of them, I believe. So we're, we're talking about the Navy was very small prior to the war. You're dealing with congressional parsimony. They're tight with a buck. Um, how Douglas, those at the same time, very uh, just a couple of years later, he made the excellent SBD. Mm -hmm. So clearly, Douglas was staying. When you look at those two airplanes, you realize that Douglas is staying very much on top of all the trends. And I was wondering, uh, as uh, uh, about about Douglas's, uh, because they, they did the DC 8, I think they, I think they built the DC 8 without doing a mock up, I believe, uh, or or maybe the first, no, the first, or no prototype, the first one was sold. In other words, and Douglas, Douglas seemed to do a lot very quickly for a lot of other companies. I don't know if they were better funded or just had more time. We're, we're going through more stages. So I was wondering about Douglas's uh, development process uh, on a lot of these aircraft, how they're able to make these leaps so quickly. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good point. And uh, I can address it with uh, two stories on uh, some Navy airplanes. They're a little more modern. One is the A-4 Skyhawk and the other is the A-3D Sky Warrior. Um, but I think it, uh, it addresses how these airplanes wind up looking the way they do and, and uh, the advancements and everything else. Let's start with the A-4. Mm -hmm. uh, the A-4 in its day, uh, first flew in 1954, and uh, was at that time the longest continuously produced military aircraft, uh, building just, just under 3,000 of them. Uh, last one was delivered in 1979. 
And then the C-130, which is still in production today now, is the, has the record for the longest uh, continuous production of a military airplane. But the A-4 was designed around uh, a wingspan. It was designed around a spec. Ed Heineman was given a specification and the wingspan, the maximum wingspan could be 27.6 feet. And with that one little piece of information, he designed a whole airplane around that. And why was it 27.6 feet? Because that's the maximum distance that you could have the wings on an airplane, have two of them pass each other, being towed on the hangar deck of an Essex class aircraft carrier without needing to fold the wings, okay? That was the secret to the A-4. So it was a one piece wing, that's where it got the name Scooter, Bantam, Bomber, uh, Heinemann's Hot Rod. Uh, it was a great little airplane. Uh, I had the honor of flying in one and you wear it. I mean, you're sitting in the cockpit and it's just, you, you are part of that airplane. It's, a, it's very tight, uh, beloved by everybody who ever flew one. Uh, but that was where that design came from. It was a wingspan and then they took the wing and built the rest of the airplane on it, the engine and the cockpit and the uh, you know, ability to uh, carry the payload and, and do what it did. Uh, so again, a 1950, an early 1950s airplane uh, that served uh, well through Vietnam and then flew up into the, uh, with the Marines, flew up into the 1980s, well into the 80s. Uh, but it was all designed around a, a, a dimension. Uh, and the other story was the A3 Sky Warrior, which is uh, uh, to this day the largest, heaviest uh, operational uh, airplane ever to uh, be carrier based. I know there were C 130s have landed, U2s. Mm -hmm. And you talk to the A3 vigilante guys or the F-14 guys, and they kind of, you know, mince the numbers. But the A3D um, was the largest and heaviest uh, uh, airplane to to routinely operate off an aircraft carrier. The A3D was designed around a weapon that, in the early 50s, or I should say late 40s, uh, the D Douglas engineers didn't even know what it was. You might have heard the, the military term "need to know." Mm -hmm. to information. And so they knew that there was a payload that the airplane was going to carry. And it was so large, it had the dimensions of the size and it had the weight. That's all they knew about it. Of course, it was a, it was a nuclear store. Uh, but uh, so they had, the, they had the bomb bay and then that dictated how much power, uh, how much range, all the, all the uh, performance specs came from having to carry this device of some sort uh, that was so large and weighed so much. And uh, one of the engineers even told me the story. He said when they were designing the landing gear retracting mechanism, the gear folds up into the fuselage, and they were having trouble clearing it so that the door would shut. And they had to na uh, ask uh, the Navy, can we shave three and a half feet off the rear, the aft corner of that box that's going to carry whatever it is that we're designing this thing to carry uh, to clear the tire as it folds up into the fuselage? We need, we need an extra three and a half feet. And they waited and the, the answer came back, yes, you can have three and a half feet. And they shot <laughs> the corner of the bomb bay and that was the wheel well for the main gear. <laughs> uh, it was really, a, a, you know, a different uh, slide rules and, you know, way early before digital anything. And uh, God love them, the engineers uh, made some incredible, uh, and, and, the, and the builders made some incredible airplanes using that kind of technology. But, but that's how those airplanes wind up doing what they're doing. It's not a case of somebody... Uh, you've heard the famous term back of the napkin sketch sitting in a restaurant design. You know, I think we'll, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll build a twin engine. Let's do that. It's, it's to meet the needs, the very specific needs of uh, the Navy or the Air Force and the, or the Army. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Douglas made mostly for the Navy single engine bombers and then for the military, the Air Force multi engine bombers or transports, a lot of transports. Um, but they didn't seem to get into fighters until the jet age, at least not that I'm aware of. And did that have to do with something with the McDonald merger or did they just get into fighters on their own at some point? Great question. The McDonald merger was April of 67. So we're really talking a decade earlier. And even though there was an F Foxtrot designation for the F3D and the F4D, those were interceptors. Those weren't air superiority fighters. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that goes to um, what companies were building and what they were known for building. In other words, Grumman had the Navy cats. Republic was building jet fighters for the air force generally single seat, single engine airplanes. Uh, Northrop had a number of different airplanes, but again, the you know, T-38 trainer, F-5. Um, it was only, there were only three companies that were building, uh, of all the manufacturers in the US, there were only three that were building everything. And that was uh, Douglas, Lockheed, and Convair. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Airliners, transports, bombers, fighters, missiles, 
Mm-hmm. And everything but flying saucers, for God's sakes. I mean, they, they had a tremendous... That we, that we know of. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Um, but uh, that, those were the only three companies. North American had their uh, stable of uh, fighters and bombers. But, but those three companies really had the, the, the bulk. You know, Boeing had the, the big jet bombers and, and the tankers. So there were certain companies that were known for building certain types of airplanes. And uh, so if the Air Force was looking for a transport, uh, they would go to Douglas or Boeing and they'd have a competition and, and so on. They were looking for a, a super fast air superior to fighter for the Navy. They'd go to McDonnell. This is before the merger, McDonald's mm-hmm. in St. Louis. So you've got the, uh, and, and look at the design philosophy. Um, if you look at some photos, even from the very first FH-1 Phantom, uh, it was either twin or single engines with uh, air intakes at the wing root uh, or up on the side of the fuselage. And then it grows up to, into the F-4H, or the, what became the F-4 Phantom II. And look at the, the lineage of those airplanes. There's, you can see the commonality. You can see that there was a, 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 you know, a homogenized design look to those machines. The Republic swept wing fighters, uh, any of that type of stuff. You see that there's a, a common look to it. Uh, so the, the, the government would go to, the DOD would go to the companies that were known for building the best. I always said that, uh, uh, you know, Republic was, was known for ruggedness. Douglas was known for variety. Lockheed was known for speed. Had the first, uh, the P-80, first jet and, and up to the SR. Uh, each company had its own uh, special specialty that they really, uh, you know, North American uh, with uh, some really fast airplanes, the B-70. Uh, so it's an amazing thing to just kind of look at the cross section of or the array of product uh, in the golden age from the end of World War II, say to uh, up into the 70s or 80s, and you you see where the where the chips fall in terms of who's going to build what. Uh, and that brings us over to the next thing where we're talking about. Uh, it seems like certain kit model makers, like, like the like the military service, has kind of had their favorite companies to go to and. Uh, so I'll let you, I, th- I think you did a little research on that. So I'll let you pick up the ball and run with that. Yeah, here you're talking to the uh, ye old model builder from the 50s here, old school <laughs> guy. And uh, I, until you asked me this question, I had never realized the significance of the locale of a model company to what they chose to build. So here's the punchline. Ravel uh, was, uh, let's use them as the poster boy. Okay, Ravel Models was located in Venice, California, which is right near the beach, uh, about oh, three and a half miles north of LAX or so. Uh, it's a nice beach city, Venice. And uh, they had a little factory, a little modest, little one-story factory building on Glencoe Avenue. And I looked at the companies that were or in LA and even down to Convair in San Diego and looked at the miles between the plant. And it was staggering. Uh, from Ravel to Douglas El Segundo was six and a half miles. To Santa Monica was three and a half miles. Northrop and Hawthorne, North American and Englewood. The, 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 far, the farthest away in LA was uh, Lockheed, 23 miles away in Burbank. And then you had Convery in San Diego. So here's the deal. Between 1954 and 1960, Ravel, and I checked their catalogs, um, produced uh, 73 different types of airplane kits. Of those 73, 39, were from Southern California, more than half, okay? And the leader in terms of numbers was Ravel with uh, 13. Convair and Lockheed both had 10 different types of airplanes and and missiles. Uh, And then you had the uh, North American with four, Northrop with two. Um, We can talk about the specific kits if you'd like to, but, but that was the breakdown is that the vast majority of models and the types of airplanes uh, chosen to be models by Ravel were right here in Southern California within a 25 mile radius with the exception of San Diego. And so, like I said, when you see on the covers, you know, scale from official plans, <laughs> blueprints, that's where they got the blueprints. And it's literally a drive across town. And in so doing, uh, when you look at the Prius Revell era, the, the 54, 55 timeframe, uh, they, the company was, a stat, was, was becoming very well established with the manufacturers. So they were dealing with public relations and the, the corporate reps and even maybe some of the engineering talent. And everybody knew everybody they were going to lunch was on first name basis. And so they created this kind of a network. Uh, so when the new, you know, Lockheed comes out with the F-104, um, it's like, well, we just did the Connie, so let's do the 104. Sure, let's do that. You know? So they, it was a very symbiotic, very cooperative, uh, uh, you know, 
one help one hand helps the other type relationship. But that's that's where that all happened. Uh, when you look at the East Coast companies, Grumman, Republic, Martin, and Baltimore, uh, McDonald and St. Louis, uh, they all had one or two, maybe three uh, types of kits, and, and that was it. Uh, I, I didn't ask you about this in advance because I only learned uh, about it the past couple of days. Uh, yeah. But apparently, believe it or not, kit model companies are having a lot of trouble now getting rights to make certain model airplanes because as the companies merge, and so I good. just had a chat with the guys at Atlantis and they went into great detail about this. I imagine back in those days, he even said back in the days you're talking about the 50s, 60s, 70s, they wanted their models made. It brought, but, but now it's the complete opposite. Yeah, I am so glad you brought this up, Max. Thank you. This is, this is a stunning point. Um, I won't mention any names, but uh, uh, as you may know, I, I worked for a, a book company for uh, quite a long time editing aviation books. And this is, this is the, I couldn't make this up if I tried. I was dealing with an author who uh, was writing about uh, a North American product. And North American, as you know, was merged into Boeing. Uh, and I say this kindly, this is just, this is all factual, but he wound up having to pay money for the licensing to use a photo that North American sent him when he was a kid. Okay, because it was going to appear in a book and the book was going to make money and, uh, you know, it got to be this, this just amazing array of uh, uh, legalities and all sorts of other things. I don't want to get into too much detail, but uh, that, that's where the industry had gone. So let, let's peel the calendar back to the early 50s. Uh, I sh I'm sure I'm not alone. Out, all the people watching, raise your hand if you ever wrote away to an airplane company for a set of lithos or photos <laughs> of a jet or something. And uh, I'm sure there are folks out there sitting there just going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Well, you're looking at one of them right here. And the stuff I used to get from these people, it, it just, I think about it today, it just brings tears to my eyes. They would write letters. Dear Michael, thank you for writing to Douglas or Lockheed or Republic or, you know, Convair. I got, I, got I got a letter from a company historian, uh, Nelson Fuller in San Diego, uh, plus a stack of prints and photos and God, uh, every kind of product you can think of. And then in the letter, it told me what courses I should study to be an engineer and to <laughs> do my best and work hard. You know, and it's a full page letter on Convair letterhead. I'm like, I'm 12 years old. What are they, you know, what were they doing? They were investing in their future employees. Exactly. And so you build brand loyalty and they weren't doing it on purpose. That's just the way the industry was, you know, little mm -hmm. Billy was going to write and, and wanted a picture of a, of a DC eight and, you know, wow, we're going to send him a litho. And so the companies couldn't have been more thrilled to have people interested in their product, uh, you know the the uh, the coverage they'd get in Life magazine or the the, the, the print media at that time, uh, that was golden. I mean, you know, the first, the Quest to Mach Two, the Douglas Skyrocket, you know, Scott Crossfield at Edwards Air Force, and they'd have these articles, and you were just basking in this glory of how spectacular the industry was at that time, and the companies couldn't do; they were falling over each other to help and uh, and support the. Um, uh, today we call it community outreach, mm -hmm. but the, the PR effort and the PR uh, uh, coverage for the company products, that was the name of the game. And that changed in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, to apply it to models. A lot, I see a lot of the commentary on your site about when uh, the companies went from beautiful box art to photos. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was all happening about the same time. And that was uh, a result of what they call mm -hmm. truth in advertising. Believe they were, they were parents of kids who took issue with the fact that you're, you're building a Navy destroyer and it's shown firing guns and there are guys all over the deck and there are planes diving down and there's all this big action, but, but the guns don't fire on the model mm -hmm. and there's no guys on the deck on the model. So that's not fair. You're, 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 you're uh, uh, you know, you're being fraudulent showing the kids what they think they're going to build. I mean, that was the mindset. Uh, and so you suddenly had this litigious society, this, this wave of, uh, legal action, and that's where that whole li you know, corporate liability thing came from. And I'll tell you who loses on that. And again, I, I, I'm trying to be, I don't want to be too pointed, and I'm not, not going to mention any names, but I was doing, as an artist, you see some of the airline prints behind me, I get a good deal on these, so that's why they're bad. <laughs> um, and I was doing a series of airliner prints of U.S. carriers. We did uh, Braniff, Eastern, uh, Pan Am, TWA. And then we got to a certain airline, and uh, they required a $500 per year licensing fee to use their name and their corporate logo in a piece of artwork. 
So that airline did not have an airplane represented in the series. All those lithos pretty much sold out and are hanging in homes and offices all over the country, if not the world today. And who loses in that situation? It was the airline that required our pub my publisher to pay 500 bucks a year to use the, the name uh, on, a, on the side of a jet in a lithograph. And ultimately, they're not represented in the series. So uh, it's kind of a, you know, it's a two-edged sword. But uh, I just want to make the point that it did change big time. And now today, as you say, you know, you look at some of the model companies in the corner will say built under, you know, uh, licensed by Boeing or whoever it is. Uh, and that has to be stated on the, on the, uh, on the box. It's kind of like putting skill level. Yeah. Uh, you started that stuff, you know. I'd like to know who determines that skill level because I've had some skill level two kits. And I'm sitting there like, you got to be kidding. <laughs> you know, I got my IP set. I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah, this um, kit goes to 11. You know, you got to be really good to build this kit. Well, the just real real quick, and we'll move on to the next thing, is that uh, yeah. they, they told me point blank that Lockheed, and he, he, he named names, so I guess it's okay. Lockheed was not letting them make the Cheyenne or the Jolly Green or the P3 Orions, all that. Mm -hmm. They can do the real old stuff like the Connie's, and they want their new stuff. But And, and I was like, is this – it's too expensive? He goes, he's like, no, Lockheed is not letting anyone do it. I'm like – it's free money for Lockheed. Why would they care if somebody makes the, the Cheyenne or, or the P3? But yeah. what, what went on in that meeting? <laughs> but so, anyway. Uh, here's, here's another one. Um, there was a company that uh, started sniffing out the fact that uh, as, the, as the aviation art industry grew in the mid to late 1980s and all these guys like myself were printing prints and having uh, World War II aces sign them, and it, was a, it became a huge multi-million dollar uh, industry. And uh, one of the large airplane manufacturers on the West Coast uh, got wind of this and sent a, uh, a letter from their legal department to every art gallery, publisher, artist, um, you know, anything that had anything. If you'd said the word airplane, you were going to get this letter saying that you had to uh, show them what you were making and explain uh, how it was going to be done. And then they were going to charge you a licensing fee for I mean, think about it. The guy does a P-38 signed by Charles McDonald or TWA Connie signed by uh, Captain Blackburn or something like that. And then suddenly they're going to they're gonna claim licensing rights. So here's what happened. They put out this edict that everybody has to, you know, send in. Uh, hang on one sec here. Okay. Um, that you have to send in what you're doing and tell them and explain why and all and then pay a licensing fee. The legal department had four hundred thousand responses <laughs> and they just kind of went we're good there's no i mean the, they would have had to hire hundreds of attorneys to sit there and go through each one of these i mean it was it was they were it, just, it was an avalanche and they suddenly realized what they were up against and, and suddenly it just kind of magically uh, disappeared went away never heard from them again. It part of me finds it rather odd that anyone can claim license on something like a Mustang or P38, not because only because of the age, but also because tax dollars funded the design and construction of those aircraft. So you'd think it'd be public domain, but I'm not a lawyer. But we'll march on to the next thing. We we, yeah, we can make a whole show about that alone. Uh, so uh, what what do we have next on the list? Do you have it in front of you? Oh, you were. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, we talked about it, all that sort of stuff. Um, you were going to ask me what my favorite A4 kit and box art was. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I do have an answer, but again, I have to qualify it. My apologies mm -hmm. to your viewers. Uh, I am a, a 50s baby boomer kind of guy. I was uh, 10, 12 years old at the peak, you know, when Revell S kits were all the rage. So I would have to answer in that context that it was the, uh, the, the first reissue of Revell's A4 Skyhawk with the bullpup missiles. It had a, mm -hmm. uh, it was a white airplane with blue markings shown on a hangar deck and the, the armament guys in their red uh, shirts were putting the missiles up on the wing. And uh, I remember building that in summer camp and it was just, it, it looked just like the real airplane. It was a sweet kid. It was really, that would be the, that was my favorite uh, A4 and, and uh, box top. It brings, actually, you'd mentioned you'd flown an A4. I, at the, I believe it was the Hiller Museum. I sat in the simulator. Yeah. And I'm, I'm big and I wasn't this big then, but I was like, you have got to be kidding. Who designed this thing? I thought it was going to be flown by a 12 year old girl. <laughs> I, there's so many vivid memories. I was in a TA4J, uh, and uh, uh, I remember strapping into the cockpit, and it was it was cozy. And then I look at the radar altimeter; it says 14 feet. The radar altimeter was 14 <laughs> feet off the ground, 
And it is the first airplane in my life that on the takeoff roll, I didn't know when we were airborne. The, the ride was, the wing loading was so, so high. And the ride was just, you know, rock hard. Uh, I should say solid. And so uh, the pilot, uh, you know, pulled the gear up on the roll and we stayed in ground effect and just went all the way to the end of the runway in a 60 pull and went straight up. And I, there was this little jiggle and I'm like, are, are we, we're still on the ground? No, we're, no, oh, we're flying. Oh, cool. You know, you, there was no sense of, rotating and, and, and getting that buoyancy of being in the air. And uh, God, that airplane, the roll rate, I uh, got a little stick time. Uh, what, a, what a machine, I, I just, I fell in love, you know, and, and I, was, I was sad when, when it was over. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, a, that was an amazing experience. And again, subsonic, no, bur no burner, but uh, a lightweight attack airplane, boy, that was, that was, that was it, that was the best. One of my, uh students he was a military aviator he was getting his civilian ratings when i was a flight instructor mm -hmm. and uh, he, he was a ta4j guy he'd been at he'd been at gitmo for a long time but he said that the one thing a lot of people understand about that airplane and i realize this is part of the reason that military pilots wear helmets uh, in fighters mm -hmm. um he goes you look at them all all the canopies are marked up because a little bit of turbulence in your <laughs> and oh, yeah. your head's bouncing off the canopy <laughs> oh, yeah. so uh, they don't ride the turbulence so well but but get i, I I had seen them all my life, but the first time I really got close to an A4, I might have been at the Smithsonian at the in, the in the Navy exhibit, but I remember walking up to it, and it's just like, that thing is just, you look at the top, it's just like an arrowhead. I mean, it, it, there's more wing than it looks like because there's got that, 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 that sweep to it, but it's, uh, it's really a compact piece of equipment. It's impressive. They yeah, get the, all other thing too, the other thing to mention about the design, and this goes back to the brilliance of the genius of Ed Heinemann, is that with the exception of adding like the hump on the M models and the, all the avionics and the uh, you know forward and rear looking IR and all that kind of, other, other than all those types of accoutrements of, of equipment being literally bolted on the airframe, the design never changed. Mm -hmm. You know, you never saw uh, you know suddenly they had to add wing fences or uh, there were vortex generators here and there, but I mean the, the basic design of the airplane was the same from the from the very first prototype to the very last one they delivered in uh, February of '79. When I was a regional jet pilot, one of my captains uh, was a retired naval aviator and 20-year man, and he managed to spend the entire 20 years in the cockpit of A4s. And he's gone from the early models to the last block. Wow. And he had which I think was the end model. Um, A4M and, for the Marines, yeah. And it literally had like twice the thrust of the originals. Yeah. And apparently that airplane in a subsonic, it is a, it is a force to be reckoned with. It is, it'll, it'll, hold it, it'll hold its own today. Yeah, well, a uh, perfect example, the, the Pratt J-52 was added at the F model, and that the Blue Angels were flying those in the, uh, I think, from like 76 to 80, 84, something like that. Um, and so when the Blue Angels were flying the A4F, they had the new engine, and they stripped it of all the armament, all the tactical equipment, everything that wasn't just the bare bones. They had, I think they had uh, room for the ladder for the guys to climb in a cockpit, and that was it. And that airplane had a thrust-to-weight ratio of one-to-one. Which is magic number, today, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where that before that wasn't just a stock A4 out of the inventory, and they painted it blue and it went and did air shows. That was a really hot airplane, but yeah, it had some had some some beans to it. Had some nice performance. Uh, the uh, the Douglas bombers, uh, like the B18 Bolo, which I think was based on the C47 or the right. DC maybe, but um, they that that was one airplane that uh, although okay as an airplane, apparently it never fared very well as a bomber probably just trying to run with what they had on this on the money congress would give exactly. them off, they call it off the shelf and off, yeah. off the shelf design and they had the turrets that came up vertically and that was <laughs> it wasn't wasn't well, the problem but you know but, but. Well, well one of my favorite airplanes of the second world war has always been the uh the a20 mm -hmm. and uh, i believe that's a douglas design isn't it the a20 havoc well it's, it's a douglas airplane but here's the, this is interesting because the designer was a young engineer named ted smith Oh, Aerostar yeah. Ted Smith. Yeah, so think about that. A high wing twin engine, uh -huh. dihedral, gee, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Aero Commander. Aero Commander. That's where um, it all came from. And he, so he did the A20, the A26, uh, the Aero Commander, and then, of course, the Piper Aerostar. But uh, he was a, uh, he and uh, he had a, a team of 11 other young uh, Douglas engineers uh, created that airplane. I just thought that airplane was, when you think about it, I can't think of any other airplane of the era that was set up quite like it was really quite. Right. Quite impressive. I mean, you've got a single pilot with a bombardier and a radio operator, depending on the model. So you can have the gun nose and guns on the wings and rockets, but you still got a bomb bay. You still got mm -hmm. some defensive armament. And I understand it was pretty fast, 
Yeah. It just, and of course, it was purpose built, but it just seemed like a, a really inspired design. Yeah, the English used them, the Havoc, and you know, it was, and then they had the night fighter version, the radar version, so it was a versatile airplane. But uh, again, that begat the A twenty six Invader, and uh, the Invader is one of the few airplanes to have an A and a B designation, yeah. depending on which war you're in and, and what they needed it for. Uh, but um, uh, let's talk about Air Force bombers, if you yeah. want. Mm -hmm. That, that sure. reverts to the Long Beach plant. And uh, I think a, a great example of how things work, you had the A3D Sky Warrior, a twin engine uh, J57 powered uh, attack bomber uh, with big folding wings for, for carrier ops. And then you had the Air Force B66, totally different, looked similar, totally different airplane, different engines, different cockpit, uh, just a whole different mission. Those were used of course for uh, you know, electronic warfare and NOM. Uh, Pathfinder missions and so on and so forth. If you saw the movie Back 21, yeah, yeah. Army 66. Uh, so that was a Long Beach airplane. Um, but there was a lot of that kind of uh, crossbreeding or you know inbreeding of uh, airframe usage. Um, and and if I may, the, the last thing to mention about Long Beach, I, I talk about the transports: C74 Glowmaster, C124, uh, C133, the C17. Uh, which, uh, you know, was a late 1980s uh, aircraft uh, came, coming out of uh, Long Beach for the Air Force. Uh, I think they built 200 and something of them. Fabulous airplane. I mean, it replaced, it was the halfway point between the 130 and the C5. Mm -hmm. And it was soft field and had stole performance. It was a great machine. To, they're, they're all over the world today. Um, think about this. You know, here we're talking about World War II. There were 39 different major aircraft manufacturers or subcontractors in the United States during World War II. Call it four, call it 40, okay? And by the time we got to the 50s and 60s, that number was coming down The mergers. You've mentioned that in one of your programs. Mm -hmm. The mergers were just devouring uh, companies like crazy. But of all the Southern California air, aircraft manufacturers and all the, you know, dozens of different kinds of airplanes that were built in the state of California, uh, and I'm in LA for, for the, if the viewers didn't know that, um, the C-17 Glowmaster III, which ended production, I believe, in 2005. Um, you can fact check that, leave a comment, but I believe it was 2005. Was the last fixed wing manned full production airplane built in the state of California. Today we have Robinson helicopter in Torrance. We have all sorts of, you know, General Atomics and Northrop unmanned vehicles. But the C-17 was the last airplane, major production airplane built in the state of California uh, 15 years ago. That's a sobering, you know, just you, can't, you think about where the industry was in the glory days. And this segues into, we'll get back into the models here in a second. But it's a, you know, you just think about that. And it's like, you know, somebody would have said to an engineer back in the 50s, hey, guess what? You know, in, in 60 years where you're sitting here, this will be a shopping center. <laughs> this company won't even exist. And that's the way it's going to be. And he would have said, you're out of your mind. So I, I just, uh, you know, I, I'll get off my soapbox, but I mean, it was just, uh, when, that, when that all happened, it was just, uh, I, I, could, I couldn't process it. Which of the Douglas airliners were made in California or were they all made in California? Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, all the airliners. The, all the airliners were built in, in uh, California. Uh, the prop piston powered airplanes from the DC one, which was a prototype. So the, let's say the DC two to the DC seven were Santa Monica airplanes. Mm -hmm. Santa Monica had a 5,000 foot runway and uh, that they could operate in and out of there for, for pre-delivery test flights and everything. So that was the, uh, the, the, the prop world of Douglas was Santa Monica. When the DC-8 happened, they needed a longer runway and they moved the entire operation to Long Beach in uh, about 1956 or 7. First flight of the DC-8 was May of 58. Uh, and so that suddenly uh, just kind of became the center of the universe and Long, and Long Beach at that time still had A-4 production. It was moved down from South Segundo, uh, DC-8, then the 9 in 1965, the DC-10 in 1970, and all the derivatives that came all the way to the end in 1997. Uh, the plant was leveled to the ground about 10, 15 years ago. It's now the Douglas Business Park. Uh, although the final assembly buildings are still there on Lakewood Boulevard, the two large, uh, the buildings with the big Fly Douglas sign, now says Fly DC Jets. That, that sign was preserved as a California historic landmark. It's lit up every night. If you drive the four or five freeway and look over at the airport, there's that sign in the red and blue uh, neon. Uh, but those two large buildings are owned by Mercedes-Benz, 
which uses them for the processing facility for all the cars coming in on the West Coast. So the ramps that literally had DC 8s, 9s, and 10s are now covered with literally thousands of cars all being prepped for delivery, and they all go out on these car carriers 24-7. Uh, so you've got the Fly DC Jets and then a big Mercedes logo right underneath it. It uh, gets your attention. About 12 years ago, uh, uh, about 12 years ago, I was flying out of Long Beach. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, even though I was based in Orlando, we, we would wind up spend a couple of days in California. Sure. And um, uh, which I, I love flying in California for the weather and everything and all the cool stuff to see. But all the general aviation traffic, I was like, holy, I, I'm a Florida pilot. We have a lot here, but California, you're in, a, you're in your own world. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, uh, there was a B1, uh, bomber, B1B, I guess, parked across the airfield on Long Beach. Somebody who I guess was in the know, a local said that to goes, he goes, oh yeah, um, that's a test aircraft that they test all the new toys on. And apparently it had something to do with Douglas, but I was like, okay, Douglas didn't build the B1. And I didn't know if had Douglas absorbed Rockwell at some point or, or. Well, by that, do you remember roughly the time frame? Well, if, if you fly, it's a, how long ago you said? About, about, 12, about 12 years ago. Yeah, it was Boeing at that time. Boeing would uh, build these uh, avionics packages or uh, cockpit upgrades. They would bid on these uh, one, one time uh, upgrade programs, and uh, that's, that's where that all happened. Okay, so that, it was already, Douglas has already gone from the name point at that point. Yeah. Also, you know, they did interiors for the C 130 gunship. There were all sorts of uh, smaller projects that uh, the company bid on and won to do a six month, one year, two year uh, program to upgrade other companies' uh, airplanes. But think about it, the B1B was Boeing at that time also. But See, was I, was, I, I, I was I was kind of bummed out because I was like, we're at Long Beach, where's all the cool Douglas stuff, you know, and where are the rows of DC and, you know, MD-80s about to be delivered and they're like, you're, Dude, you're a decade behind. <laughs> years too late. I hired in in 1977, and uh, you'd, you'd pull up in the morning and park the car and look down the west ramp, and those DC-10 tails were lined up like cordwood, you know, in all the different airline markings. Uh, and they were going, and then the KC-10 came in, and the uh, YC-15. I mean, it was a beehive of activity. It was just going like, like crazy about that time. The company employed about 16,000 people at that point, and, uh, boy, it was – you, you literally could not drive up to the airport and not see a Douglas airplane of some type taking off or landing or in the pattern. Literally. Uh, a retired Naval aviator I know, uh, who was actually my younger brother's boss for a while, mm -hmm. um, was, uh, he said he, he enlisted in the Navy and he enlisted as an enlisted man and retired as a captain. Oh. Um, and he was a career Naval aviator. And he said the thing that hooked him uh, was the, the Skyray, the F-4. Uh, the, the F4D. And uh, I guess in the fifties or something, or whenever, when exactly it came out, he'd seen built a model of one. And so th you were talking earlier about how they would send kids stuff because the recruiting power of a model or, or artwork is not to be underestimated. And he was bummed out because when he got out of Navy flight training, they, uh, uh, the, the, the sky is no longer an in inventory. And uh, he was, so he had to go fly vigilantes, poor fellow. Um, but uh, I wonder if you could talk about uh, about the Skyray a little bit because that's sure. a Douglas fighter back before they were never really known as a fighter company at that you know by themselves to my knowledge. Yeah, it was it was a fleet defense interceptor. It was armed with Sidewinder missiles. Uh, it set uh, world speed records. It set a uh, number of world time to climb records. Uh, again, you know, forty thousand feet in a minute and a half from a standing start. That kind of stuff. Uh, it was an amazing airplane. The bat wing, you know, the Douglas rounded Delta wing. And of course, the successor was the F-5D Sky Lancer. Lancer, yep. Mm -hmm. Supersonic airplane. Uh, never, never went into production. Although NASA flew them, the, uh, the last airplane that Neil Armstrong flew before he went to astronaut training was the F-5D Sky Lancer for NASA. Um, and I believe that airplane is at a museum in his hometown today. But um, this this raises an interesting point. In that time period, the airplane designs were highly mission specific. So the Air Force needed an interceptor. We'll make the F-104, the F-102, Delta mm -hmm. Dagger, the 106. Those were interceptors. They didn't carry bombs. They didn't have guns. Well, the 104 had a gun. But, I mean, you know, they were primarily interceptor airplanes for, uh, you know, uh, intercepting and stopping uh, enemy bombers coming in over the pole with missiles. Uh, so the F-4D was, was born in that role. It was a carrier-based fleet defense interceptor. Um, the F-3D Sky Knight, which is the only other 
Douglas Airplane to have an F designation for the Navy, uh, was a um, radar interceptor used in Korea. Made the first night-to-night uh, kill, uh, uh, radar intercept kill, first jet-to-jet kill uh, using radar guidance. Uh, it was a pioneering, I mean, kind of, a, you know, by today's standards, straight wing, uh, funky type airplane, but it really, it did the job. Uh, but again, it met a very specific mission. My point is, look at the F-18 today. Look at the F-4 Phantom in the 70s. That was a, the first real multi-role fighter. You put cameras in the nose, you put a gun on the nose, you put missiles on it, you put bombs on it. It does everything. Uh, the F-4G, Wild Weasel, after the 105s, it is the jack of all trades. And now look at any carrier... To, Perfect example, in 1956, 55% of all the Navy air, uh, airplanes based on carriers were built by Douglas, 55%. Uh, and that includes the Sky Warrior, uh, Sky Raider, the prop uh, airplanes. Um, so they had the bulk of the market. Grumman, of course, had others in North America, but, uh, and McDonald. But today, look at, look at the deck of uh, the new USS Ford or the Vincent or any, any of the modern carriers, Roosevelt. How many different kinds of airplanes do you see on the on the flight deck? I can think of three: the E twos, the F eighteens, and the helicopters. <laughs> and maybe it may, maybe a COD plane, but, yeah, but he's that, not really that, based there. An F eighteen, a legacy F eighteen, or the Super Hornet, or a Growler. Uh, you know, but it's, it's the same airframe doing whatever is needed of it, and it just makes a very compelling uh, case for how many different kinds of. Uh, I mean, look at the Air Force inventory. You know, they built what 5,000 F-84 Thunder jets and Thunder streaks uh, as a uh, you know it could, it could do air to air if it had to, but it was mainly a ground attack mm-hmm. airplane. Um, you know, uh, how many thousands of B-47s? Uh, they were just making uh, you know mountains of, of airplanes of to to fly just one specific mission, and that is what changed over the years. So uh, back to the F-4D uh, conversation. Um, you know, when you think of the models, I mean, it was Lindbergh's uh, white and with red marking uh, XF-40 uh, prototype, which was the record, that was the record setting airplane. Yeah. It had that, I think it was Ray Gennett artwork with it. You know, that was. God, the, 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 there were speed lines coming off the speed line. <laughs> but, uh, and then you had the smaller uh, Hawk operational F-4D-1 Skyray, which I, it was a lovely little kid, really looked like the airplane. But that was it. It, it wasn't. Wasn't like something like the B fifty eight where what was it Ravel monogram Aurora Comet Lindbergh, Str- you know Strombecker everybody made a B fifty eight kit, uh, and this kind of leads to one of your other questions is what determines what uh, and forgive me if I'm making too big a jump here but uh, you know what what determines what models are made by a company we talk about proximity but uh, I was thinking you know think of all the co- the models that were one of a kind for whatever the company was. You know what I'm saying? Monogram makes a Grumman uh, SU or HU-16 Albatross. Mm-hmm. The only one on the market, right? Strombecker makes a, a Converse Sea Dart, the only one on the market. Um, and, you know, you could play a, a good, fun trivia contest, name how many one-of-a-kind, uh, you know, one-time only kits were made by any number of different uh, companies. Aurora X-13 Vertijet, yep. you know, that's the only one. Which is why they're so valuable today. <laughs> kind of like that, yeah. The, uh, the stay, staying with the kit models and, and getting back into your wheelhouse of artwork. Yep. Um, now that I've been doing this a while, I'm getting to the point where I can almost say that's a Linwood, that's a Gadek. Am I saying a Gadek or Gadecki? Uh, the Gadke. 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 I'm always I'm always mortified. I'm saying these people's names wrong, you know, and. Uh, um, and uh, and and the uh, so many of the other the artists that are out there, but after a while you start to, to recognize a style, and some of them you actually start to realize an evolution. You know, you see their earlier work and their later work. But yep. that, my gosh, I, I looked at all the Limber. He must have done a couple of hundred of those things, and these models were all in production at the same time, which means he had to be working fast. Um, but uh, the sales power of box art. I don't think it can be overstated just like art as a recruiting tool. We talked about earlier. Um, so present company excluded, of course, who are a few of your favorite artists and, and, and their favorite works? 
Well, of course, the, the godfather is Jack Lenwood. And uh, as I always said, he's my first art teacher till 20 years before I actually met him. Um, I, I stole so much of his uh, stuff and learned so much from, from his work. Um, I, God bless him. I mean, he just, he, I, I, I might have said this before, but I, I don't think he had any idea of the impact of his artwork on, on our generation. I really don't. He was such a, a modest, such a humble, beautiful uh, person. And uh, it was one of these, uh, oh, shucks, you know. Yeah, but, well, and I'd say, yeah, gosh, Jack, how many, how many covers did you do? 625. What? You know, ah, it was, it was just, you know, it, it, he said, uh, paint them and print them and throw them out. Make the next one. He would do, he would do the small, the, uh, the 98 cent kits. He'd do, a, he'd do that in one day. So I get up early and go for a run on the beach and have breakfast. And I just sit down and I do it because I don't want the colors have to match and I don't want to lose the color. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he would just blast through and, and work into the night and there it was finished. And he would do one, one a week, one or two a week. I mean, it was just incredible. Uh, so, so to answer your question, Jack, of course, um, uh, you had Campbell doing the Hawk kits. You had uh, mm -hmm. Morgan doing the uh, monogram stuff. Cal Smith did the Strombecker art. He was an LA artist. I loved his a very clean, smooth, creamy look to his his artwork. Um, and of course, uh, Gad Key with the Lindbergh stuff. Uh, it was, you know, it was kind of the, you know, it was like saying you, you like the Beatles or the Stones better. I mean, it was, yeah. <laughs> that, that whole era, you know, it was just it was everything was great. But uh, yeah, I, I'd have to say, you know, Jack, of course, set the set the mold. He was he was he was the man, and then you had. All the others. Uh, now you've done some box arts, haven't you? Yeah, I did. Uh, what did you do? Ten covers for Lodella, Ravello, Mexico. That's right, Lodella. Yes. I have a, uh, a YouTube video about that experience, uh, and I say ten covers. I did nine actual paintings, and the tenth one was a drawing that I designed that was painted by a Mexican artist years later. That was the Thunderbirds F84. So I claim that as my. my I, I saw the video, and now, now that that triggered, I was like, I remember it now. Yes. I remember you tried to sketch first and everything. Yeah. Now, uh, for, for the viewers, it was a companion piece to the Blue Angels F9, F8 uh, Cougar. So we were going to do a Cougar, which was going this way, and an F84 Thunderbirds going that way. Mm -hmm. And the Cougar came out, and then they went, yeah, the F84, we'll just wait a little bit. And by that time, mm -hmm. I had already moved on to other stuff. But uh, that was, a, a, I want to say, a five- or six-year association with uh, Ron Ferreira, who was the uh, art director and L.A. representative for Ladella and just a fabulous guy. Uh, we had, we had so we were like two kids. It was just so much fun working with him. Um, do you have do you have a preferred? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, uh, uh, supplementing the the box tops were the direction sheets, which I did the uh, stencil the uh, patterns for the direction sheets and the uh, direction sheet artwork, uh, the the profiles, which showed where the decals went and all that sort of stuff. Brings up an interesting question. It's popped in my head because we covered we I was talking with Rick Vetri about this last night at Atlanta's. He was saying that right now, when you're set up to, to produce a model, the plastic, the kit is the most expensive part. It's, he said the box and the instructions and the decals can cost more than the actual contents of the model. Yeah, and, right. I, and I asked him, okay, if I, wanna, if I come to you and say I want to fabricate this mold model, to, you know, figure 50 to 100 grand to get a basic 148 scale model mm -hmm. made, then, of course, you got to get the shelves. But he said, uh, then you got to figure out you got to pay someone to do the box art, and then you got to pay someone to do the instructions. Just ballparking, say your standard, like this Sky 148 Sky Raider. There it is. Uh, kit like that, probably 100 parts total with all the ordnance. If I said, uh, Mike, uh, and, and this is just totally a generic a spitball. If I said, Mike, I want you to do box art for me and do the instruction sheet for me. What would a person realistically expect to, to, to pay uh, a talent to, to produce that? Well, I, I can only speak of that time period, and uh, uh, the uh, there was a an industry standard in those days. You couldn't just sit there and go, "Yeah, I want ten grand for a model box top," because I feel mm -hmm. that's like what I wanted. You know, there was a, a definite criteria uh, for pricing your artwork. Uh, again, a lot of that was governed by the Society of Illustrators, mm -hmm. and so they had a pricing guide that would actually come into play depending on how it was being used, how many pieces were being reproduced size, the complexity, the deadline, there are all these different factors. Um, I would say box art in the, in the 70s time frame, uh, you'd be in the 3500 to $5,000 range, somewhere in, that, in that, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. Like that. Now with the instruction sheet, be, would the instruction sheet be more or less? That's a separate, that would be a separate charge and that's all depending on how many panels. 
Mm. So if you if you look at like a Lindbergh sheet where there's one or two views of the model and a bunch of call outs and they tell you, you know, put part A into part B and that, uh, that's much simpler than the Ravel sheets where it was just, you know, panel after panel of here's the fuselage, here's the wings, here's where the landing gear goes. It was just every monogram I think has the record for the most uh, beautiful lavish uh, direction sheets where it was like 15 steps to build a TWA Connie or something like that. And every one of those panels was a separate piece of artwork. Do you have a preferred aircraft type to paint? Uh, as, as a you mean? as a subject matter, I mean, do you prefer artwork. you prefer airliners or fighters or? I love them all. I mean, I had a passion for airliners because I grew up near JFK Airport and saw them and had access to the airliners. I love the X planes. I've done many of those. Um, private commissions, the the, the uh, small uh, stuff. I've done uh, the you know the spam cans that we flew back in uh, the early uh, parts of our career. Um, if it flies, I love it. I, there's, I can't really say I had a favorite. This uh, uh, is completely off topic. It was something I was watching some of your videos, including some you did at the, uh, was it the it's the seniors, uh, the, the museum you guys give. Oh, Western, Mu Western Museum of Flight. Yeah, yeah they, they have a Peninsular Seniors or something's the name of the channel. Right. Uh, uh, I found, I've kind of gotten addicted to those because you guys have some really interesting guests. And I, and I, I watched yours also. And I just wondered if you could uh, just give you a chance to promote that channel a little bit or that, that, that institution. Tell us a little, because I'm really not sure exactly what it is. <laughs> uh, well, the Western Museum, of, it's a, ser a speaker series. They call it the Celebrity Speaker Series, and it's every Saturday, I believe, or every other Saturday. Uh, the, the museum is located on Torrance Airport. Torrance is south of about maybe 12, 15 miles south of LAX. Uh, and uh, so the speaker series uh, generates a good crowd, and they, it's in a hangar. The museum is housed in two separate hangars. And they've got a lot of cool stuff, um, but I believe they're only open on weekends. So you might check the website, Western Museum of Flight. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's a, you know, it, uh, where, where am I going with this? They, they are located on Torrance Airport. So part of the museum experience is that you can visit the museum, you can hear the lecture, and then you can walk out to the flight line. Sometimes they'll even have warbirds giving rides. Uh, when the Collings Foundation was coming in, or the EAA B-17, uh, they'd park right at the end of that ramp where the museum was, and they'd be giving more bird rides all day long for all weekend. Um, so it's a really hands-on, uh, military-oriented type uh, museum, and it's a, it's great great folks down there that work uh, for it and, and run it. Uh, and I was honored to speak there uh, twice, once on the history of Douglas and once on the history of X-Planes. And had great crowds uh, both times. If you watch the video, the question question and answer period goes on for like 20 minutes. It does. And I, 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 remember, I remember the whole thing you talked about, the shadow of Hoover's P-80 under the, uh, yeah, the whole, I'm not going to get into that. But folks, go watch it. It's great. I, I think it's, I think the name of the channel is Peninsular Seniors. Peninsular Seniors Out and About. It's called. Out and About. And it's, it's just, uh, when I saw that, I thought it was like an old folks home. the Peninsular Seniors. But I saw an airplane, I clicked and I was like, Oh, this is good. <laughs> yeah, they uh, and the production crew, uh, you know, bless their hearts. I mean, they set up a camera. I have a lavalier, and they they just they, the lighting, everything was is, is really well done. Uh, I don't usually have a, a book signing afterward and be inscribing books to people and sold a ton of books. Uh, but uh, uh, just to to you know finalize that that thought is that they have pilots. They have got they had Hoop Gibson, the astronaut. Uh, they had uh, SR seventy one guys. They had A four guys. They had Every, every Goodyear blimp captain, every possible uh, aspect of aviation, uh, someone from that world will come in and, and give really intimate detail and, and uh, good solid information for uh, an hour uh, to the audience. And they have, I think both mine were attended by probably around 250 people in that hangar. I appreciated yours. I appreciated yours because uh, I, I, I'd seen them after our first chat. But also, uh, I, I believe I believe you went into detail on painting the mural uh, at was it at Edwards, Edwards yeah. Yeah, and that was an eye opener because you see up on the scaffolding and everything, you realize that this is gives you some scale on the thing too. And, and but but the things you pointed out about it, like you know, up here at altitude, you'll you'll notice the. And I'm not going to give it away. Like you know, folks can go watch the video. But I, I was really I was really intrigued by all that. I, I it just well, that's I, great. Thank you. Well, that, that's what it's that's what it's all about. I mean, I uh, you know. I even, we were told this in art school, you know, being an artist, you're a one man show, you, you, you live in your little bat cave and you're making your artwork in the middle of the night. Uh, you and I are emailing each other at two in the morning or both night <laughs> hours. So, uh, 
so that's it. you're all by yourself. Uh, and I'll, I'll feel free to share this. I'm not embarrassed to share this with the, with the viewers. Uh, music is a big part of the painting experience for me. I have a huge library of music. Um, it's not a track CD, <laughs> but uh, a huge a library of music that covers everything from the uh, early 50s all the way to today. And I am playing the music of the era of the airplane I'm painting. And that is a, I, it's, it may sound corny and, you know, sorry, guilty as charged, but that's a big part of the experience for me. I'm painting an X-15. I want to hear the Beach Boys, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm painting a, uh, uh, you know, a, a BOAC a Super VC-10. I want, I want a Beatles or Stones album. And I want to feel, uh, here's, the, here's the best thing I can explain. When I do the 1950s X-Plane, Bell X-2, mm -hmm. Jaeger's X-1, whatever it is, X-3, I have, a, I have the platters or, you know, the coasters or something like, I have those old, funky old doo-wop type songs on there. I'm listening, as I'm painting this airplane, I'm listening to the same song that Pete Everest or Bob White or Jaeger or any of those guys was listening to on the car radio while they were driving to Edwards to fly that airplane. And if you don't think that locks it in, it's, it's, it's inspirational, it really is. And so- Actually, it, it makes perfect sense and ironically, and I was just, this just happened last week. In fact, it's, yeah. I think it's, I think I've talked about it in one of the videos. I usually play uh, movie soundtracks. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the last of the oh. weekends, right stuff, just talk. Okay. And I'm, I'm trying to build this paper launch umbilical tower to go on my Saturn V. And I gave myself a nasty burn on my thumb uh, with the hot glue gun because it's paper. And I just, and I was just getting, it, it's like origami. And it, plastic is easy compared to paper. And I was about to throw in the towel and the music and the, Thing to uh, from the earth to the moon kicked on. Oh, and I was like, yeah, you hear that that inspiring music? Like, hey, you know, back to it. Yeah, <laughs> and so yeah, it, salvaged, it, it, it salvaged the project. It makes a very deep connection, uh, especially when I remember that music from when it was new when I was a kid. But uh, there's always that. Uh, I, I don't care what what time period it is. Um, even as I say, the modern stuff today. Uh, it, the music is, I, I don't think I could paint as well if I didn't have the music playing in the background. And uh, luckily my studio is off to the side of the house so I can play it nice and loud and not bother my wife or anybody while they're sleeping. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Mike, on that, I'm going to um, uh, stay on the line. I'm going to sign off here and then stop recording. And then I want to have okay. a chat about boring stuff that the pad people watching don't care about. So, uh, folks, I want to uh, once again extend a great thank you to Mike Machat for taking time out to to – Bless my humble little backwater YouTube channel. It's an honor and, for me, man. It's an honor. And uh, we will see. Maybe I can get this up tonight. There's really not much editing. Just kind of get it all downloaded. And uh, you guys uh, have a great evening, and we'll see you all later. And three, hit the button, Max.